Kicking off the list at number 10, the Pluto Slug. Back in January 2016, the New Horizons probe was sending tons of new information back from our little ex-planet, Pluto. The icy plane shows a series of lines, almost like these giant space slugs, dare I say, are slowly moving across the surface of the planet. Check it out. It reminds me of the episode of SpongeBob, where the gang, you know, rides a rock across the ocean floor. Maybe Patrick and SpongeBob are delivering a pizza on Pluto, okay? They could be just in the weeds, they could be busy. This icy area of the dwarf planet is called the Sputnik Planum. Scientists believe so far, the reason for all these lines is that the planet is breathing in a way. If that sounds creepy, it's because it kind of is. The planet's cooling and heating and it's kind of moving around. But we'll leave some room open for space slugs because, you know what, at this day and age, you never know. I've seen enough Avenger movies. I'm like, mm, could be space worms. Number nine, Mima's Moon. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Just kidding, this one's actually really close. It's Saturn, it's right, right there. Saturn is known for having a plethora of moons. Saturn in total has 82 moons, including this one, Mimas. A moon that looks oddly familiar. Why do I feel like it's gonna just blast us all the smithereens? Why do I feel like that's gonna happen? Is that the Death Star? Is this thing pointing at Earth? Which way is it pointing here? That's, that really matters. Saturn's smallest innermost moon is causing quite the stir here on Earth. About a month ago, researchers discovered that this moon has a bit of a wobble to it, almost like a floating magic eight ball. Something is sloshing around inside. Its gravitational pull is a little off. It's kind of, it's just grooving around in the solar system, you know? Mima could potentially be housing a liquid ocean. Yep, we got more water in space. It's pretty close, too. If that was the case, everything we know about water and ocean life in space would have to be rewritten. Number eight, black hole helix. Imagine looking, peering through a telescope, and then you see this. I would throw up right into my telescope. This is a galactic jet. It shot out of a black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy. It's pretty scary looking. This helix shot out a whopping 8,000 light years. Yeah, it's pretty far. That's so far I can't even fathom how far that is. You know, like my brain won't allow me to really picture that. This sounds like a threat, really, but I'll remind you that the M87 galaxy is 55 million light years away from us. So we're not gonna get any galactic jet on our hands anytime soon, know what I mean? But just how does something like this happen? Astronomers in New Mexico discover that this massive jet is caused by a corkscrew-shaped magnetic field. What in the witchcraft? Like what? Like a space undertow made out of gravity. That doesn't sound jarring at all. According to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, this is the longest magnetic fields ever found in a galactic jet. Which is fine, that's the first time I've heard of that. I'm like, that's, you can take that rain, enjoy it. That's, we're not gonna try and beat you. It's stuff like this where I ask myself why I'm worrying about a phone bill. Humans are so tiny compared to this, it's insane. We don't matter. Hey, uh, number eight, we don't matter. Hit that thumbs up. Number seven. Jupiter's clouds. We've all seen and heard of Jupiter's big red spot. That's just a nightmare in itself. So big, always going, no idea why. Can't even think about it. But when NASA's Juno spacecraft passed the Goliath back in 2017, it captured something almost just as interesting, if not more, dare I say. Jupiter's clouds. It feels like you can just put your arm out and touch the silky space sky. It's beautiful, but that's about 20,000 kilometers away. It's also quite scary. This big ball of hydrogen is quite mysterious below these clouds. So far, NASA has found lightning higher up than they ever thought it could go. They've also found constant storms at both the North and South Pole, and winds so powerful that the planet's magnetic fields are literally being moved around. That's how strong the wind is. Your skin would just blow off. You'd be a skeleton just standing there. Beautiful, mysterious, and deadly. We love space on MA10. Number six, Mars trees. This looks like moldy bread almost. What in the hell? What are we looking at here? Is this actually a photo, a real photo from Mars? Are those trees? There's not a chance here. Matt Damon grew potatoes on Mars in the movie The Martian, but I don't think he can grow any pine trees anytime soon. What you're looking at here is still pretty insane. Due to the evaporation of carbon dioxide frost, dark sand is sliding down the frosted side of the dune, so it makes it look like there's trees on the planet Mars. Sun-heated carbon dioxide ice, that's just, I, I read that and I go, what? What does that even mean? Where do I start with this? We thought we found a giant alien back in 1976 when NASA's Viking 1 flew by and it looked like a face was in the planet. Remember that? It looks like a Jabberwocky. It's just lying getting a suntan. This one here is in an optical illusion. It's just weird space science. Number five, smooth moon. When we think of moons in the sky or like how other planets have other moons, we think of them as our own. 
just a big ball of cheese in the sky, a big sphere, it's got craters, it's pale, we get it, right? Well, as we've seen so far in this list, some moons can look like the Death Star, and some moons can look like chewed gum, apparently. Saturn's small moon, Atlas, looks like a UFO. It's not a sphere at all, it literally has the shape of a UFO. How scary is that? NASA's Cassini spacecraft caught this image back in 2017, and it almost looks like two moons have crashed into one another, and then now it has a ring-like edge to it. When new photos came back after discovering this moon way back in 1980, scientists were surprised that this moon is actually really smooth. In 4K, they're like, oh, it's not even the pixels, it's actually really smooth. A smooth moon, you say? <laughs> Let me take a look here. This little smooth moon in the sky, a little pervert. Number four, dead galaxies. This one sounds scary, dead galaxies. Guardians of the dead galaxy. New research from NASA, including the Hubble Space Telescope, along with the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in northern Chile, they found six different dead galaxies in total. They're all like, that's one, that's two, and they're like, hey, we found four, all dead, horrifying. How does this happen? Let's look into it. These dead galaxies had run out of the cold hydrogen needed to make stars, and without the fuel for new stars, these galaxies were basically running on on nothing at that point. It's kind of like when your car battery dies, only this is on a cosmic scale. This discovery led us to new questions we didn't even know we had. Like what led to these galaxies to die anyways? What happened to all the cold gas in them so early on? These six galaxies lived fast and hot lives, but we aren't sure what went wrong quite yet. Lead author and assistant professor of astronomy at the University of Massachusetts, Kate Whitaker, she proposed several potential explanations and gave us insight onto the future of the studies, which she said, did a supermassive black hole in the galaxy's center turn on and heat up all the gas? If so, the gas could still be out there, but now it's just cold. We need Thanos to come back and just, you know, start this fire up, just a big, someone get a big lighter and just go and just light it back up. Alas, new life. Is that Thor? Welcome back. Number three, solar flares. Our lives literally revolve around the sun. It blesses us with life energy, solar rotation, and most importantly, tan lines, obviously. But sometimes she acts up. Sometimes she gets a little cray cray. Sometimes she gets a little and then she spurts out lava and scares us all. Sometimes she creates these powerful magnetic fields that create sunspots larger than our entire planet. Yep, like I said, she's moody. This creates a stream of radiation. It's called solar wind. Now, normally, this is a beautiful event to see. We have many photos of it now. The northern lights happen because of Earth's magnetic field reacting to this specific radiation. Beautiful, but really scary when you think about it. This past October, a large solar flare was spotted, and then three days later, it finally hit Earth. The geomagnetic storm reached category G2, which out of five is pretty strong, especially when you look at it as a, you know, on a planetary scale. The biggest solar event was back in 1859. It's called the Carrington Event. It was strong enough to disrupt telegraph communications, even shocking, literally shocking, some telegraph operators. Like if that happens again, and it's even stronger this time, we're looking at huge power outages on a massive scale. Imagine talking to someone on your iPhone and it blows up. Right in the middle of Avatar 2, boom, blackout. Life as we know it is now meaningless. We're all crying in public. Number two, the space crab. Is the multiverse collapsing? What, what is this? The appropriately named Space Crab Nebula was discovered back in 1054. Yeah, way back then, astronomers looked into the sky and saw this new bright star. They saw it during daytime. That's how they knew something was up. What they were observing at the time was a supernova explosion. How spectacular is that? This was when the Crab Nebula was born. It's not too far away either. It's just a mere, you know, 6,500 light years tucked away in the constellation Taurus. If you're a Taurus, you're watching, you're like, oh, no way, I'm a Libra. I'm like, get out of here. What do you know? The image of the space crab here was captured over the course of three months. NASA put together 24 exposures captured by, of course, our Hubble. The orange glow we see, those are literally star remains, just large pockets of hydrogen. The interesting part here with the space crab is back in 2005, over the course of 10 Hubble exposures from September to November, these waves can be seen expanding outwards, waves coming from the nebula's pulsar. Space is so scary. We have one moon to worry about here. Meanwhile, all of this is going on in our space neighborhood. I'm terrified. And finally, number one, mystery wave. More waves coming in hot, really hot this time around. If you've seen Interstellar, this next one should hit close to home. I'm not a fan of wave pools or waves in general. My stupid head just bobbing around in the ocean, that's, that's peril, that's, that's a nightmare situation. I can't swim too well. I don't know, I'm too lanky. I'm like a piece of seaweed floating around. The largest wave ever seen in the entire solar system, of course, I had to save this one for last. On a planet a little closer to the sun, Venus, the pressure in the atmosphere can cause some massive waves. Back in 2015, a Japanese spacecraft zoomed by and caught this phenomena. Usually clouds there will move around 100 meters a second, but these clouds, these massive ripples, stayed in the same place for four days, way above the ground level also. They were just like, huh? 
and then they got stuck there. Due to a runaway greenhouse effect, temperatures on Venus hit around 460 degrees Celsius. So this wave may have been powerful enough to change the climate for those four days. Pretty crazy. I feel like Canada, we get a lot of weather changes, but this, this is next level. Kicking off the list at number 10, the largest known comet. Comet Bernadelli Bernstein. What a name right there. Okay, what a find as well, may I add. June 23rd, 2021, so pretty recently, Pedro Bernardinelli was a grad student and researcher. He was originally observing outer solar system objects like trans-Neptunian objects, stuff like that, but thanks to dark matter, he ended up finding this mega comet instead, which is pretty sweet. He's like, sure, I'll take it, let's look into it. So he went to his advisor, a cosmologist named Gary Bernstein, and he told them to look into it. Like, to literally look into it. 10 times wider than a typical comet, this thing is huge. Last time it was near our sun was a good three million years ago, and now it's back. Well, in 10 years, it'll be close. So get your wishes ready. All you have to do is say the comet's name three times fast, and you're set. Good luck. Bernard Nelly Bernstein, Bernard Nelly Bernstein, Bernard Nelly Bernstein, yes. That's a hard name to say. I was Googling it, and I'm like, oh man, I love your names. Great observation and all, but <sighs> actually, no, that's great. That's a pretty sick name. I would name a comet my last name. McWaters, easy. Number nine, the unicorn. Not to be confused with Unicron, although both are equally scary, I'd say. The unicorn is the closest black hole to Earth. But don't panic, it's not gonna, you know, turn us into spaghetti anytime soon, so we're good. The unicorn gallops 1,500 light years away from Earth. It's far away, and it's also pretty small. It's a tiny black hole, so it's extremely hard to find. That's why telescopes like James Webb will come in handy, so we can identify more of these little guys. Researchers were able to find the unicorn because a near star, a red giant for that matter, had its light shifting towards something. It's always special when you see sunlight just doing this, just melting towards something. You're like, okay, let's take a look. So they named it the unicorn because it's also tucked away in the unicorn constellation, Monoceros. The fact that it's rare also inspired the name, so yeah, it's a win-win. They're like, unicorn? Wait, can we do this? This is perfect. Also, please don't turn us into spaghetti. Thank you so much, stay away. Number eight, a new star. Our sun is around 4.5 billion years old. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, she's still young at heart, but this new star over here, whew, she's hot. This protostar, during its crazy cosmic birth, jets of gas are now whipping through space at impossible speeds, and it's beautiful. Now we get to look at it and go, wow. Thumbs up. When this material collides with the matter of the still forming star, what's created is called a Herbig Barrow object. Hubble captured it and it is glorious. We're gonna get even more beautiful shots once James Webb warms up later on this year. So this is really, you know, it's kind of like nothing. Just wait. Number seven, the Veil Nebula. While most subjects on this list are far away from us, the Veil Nebula you can see with a common pair of binoculars on clear conditions. Today, we're going with NASA's Hubble telescope view. They got a pretty good look at this gas giant. What you see here is five different layers of ionized gases. This cloud is floating around 2,100 light years away. In order to get a photo of the entire nebula, it would be, well, near impossible. See, the Veil Nebula spans 130 light years wide, which is around 100 times larger than our own solar system. So yeah, binoculars ought to do it. You'll see it somewhere, it's pretty big. Number six, total eclipse. This total eclipse was not of the heart, but it did occur back in December 2021. Not long ago at all. If you didn't see a total eclipse a few months ago, don't worry, we all missed out. I mean, unless you live in Antarctica, we all missed out on this one. This was hard to catch. For a halfway point, I figured I'd throw in a relatable, nice, yet still haunting feature. This deep space climate observatory satellite snapped a pic, and honestly, it looks like the poster of Independence Day. This is real and very scary. This massive shadow of the moon just slowly moving across the land, like the Goosebumps intro, Ah, oh, it's haunting to look at. Dark spot on the move, like something out of Star Wars almost. The next total eclipse will occur April 8th, 2024. This time it'll be in Canada, US, and Mexico. All those places will go dark, so get your flashlights ready. I'm already nervous. Number five, M64. M64, AKA the Evil Eye Galaxy, AKA the Sleeping Beauty Galaxy, which is a lot nicer. I think we should call it that from now on, definitely. This one might be the coolest space photos of all time. This looks like an artist made it with CGI. I feel like this is concept art from Interstellar. Oh my gosh. What makes the M64 galaxy so impressive to look at and worthy enough to throw on this terrifying list is the way that it moves. Ooh, the way it moves is just so... Mm. Gas on the inner galaxy rotates in one direction and the outer layer spins the, well, you guessed it, opposite way. 
This is odd behavior for a galaxy. Scientists theorize that the Evil Eye Galaxy, sorry, <clears throat> Sleeping Beauty Galaxy, is the result of two galaxies crashing into one another. The fascinating thing really is we're looking at something 17 million light years away. So this image of the Evil Eye Galaxy, Sleeping Beauty, is actually from a long time ago, most likely. Mind bending, right? Space is pretty mind bending. Also terrifying. That's why the James Webb is such a big deal. We're gonna see very far into our past, theoretically. No one really knows what's gonna happen. He's just gonna look and, oh, dinosaurs. Number four, gamma bursts. Somebody give Bruce Banner a heads up because we got a lot of gamma. We have so much gamma. When we look at extinction level events, like say, I don't know, a meteor smashing into the planet, we can bounce back from that, humans, evidently. I mean, look at us, we're doing lists now. We're like, hey, subscribe, hit that thumbs up. I mean, sure, we lost some dinosaurs along the way, but millions of years later, we're here, we're popping. But when it comes to gamma rays hitting the planet, yeah, we're, we're not so lucky at that point. We can't bounce back from that one. If a gamma ray happened any time in our past, be it millions of years ago, we still wouldn't be here. Gamma rays happen when stars explode in distant galaxies. See, light and energy then shoots out along with gamma rays, radio waves, neutrinos, just a cosmic cosmo, all that good space stuff, just shook up and then blasted at you. But then these gamma rays would travel light years through space and if they were to hit Earth, our ozone layer would be toast, just gone forever, just like that. We would be engulfed in chemical smog forever. No bouncing back from that at any point. Or if we did bounce back from it, we'd be lizards or something, you know? We'd be lizard people walking around, a bunch of licky dudes, just breathing on people. <laughs> That'd be okay. Number three, supernova. For this next one, we'll be looking at Beetlejuice. And no, I don't mean Michael Keaton, although he's pretty scary. I don't wanna say it three times. I'm keeping count just to be safe. I'm talking about the red giant located in the Orion constellation. It began to dim back in 2019, which is not a great sign. Its decay would be quite noticeable here on Earth. For example, the last time a star went supernova and we were able to observe it, the last time was 1604, and that was the Kepler star. It was beautiful and bright for weeks. Even during the day, we could still see it. All day long, people are like, that's gotta be pretty annoying, huh? Can't wait for that one. But when Betelgeuse finally dims out of existence, you have to wonder if we're far enough to be safe. Which sunscreen is good for solar flares? You know what I'm talking about? Like, I freckle up as is. I'm screwed if this happens. Scientists agree that we need to be much closer for the radiation to actually cause harm, but scientists also tell us quite often about these wandering stars and how black holes will just appear out of nowhere. So, who really knows? Beetlejuice. Number two, the sun. While it's not recommended we stare at it, the sun is pretty beautiful. Living in Canada, we're just now seeing it, maybe a little bit, just a tad, fingers crossed. No, nope, not really at all, I guess. It's a terrible idea to look at the sun, especially through a telescope, so we don't recommend that at all. Thankfully, we have photographer Andrew McCarthy to help out. Andrew layered together 150,000 different photos of the sun to create this 300 megapixel image for us to safely look at. I opened this photo on my phone and my phone literally got hot. I was like, wow, this is a great photo. I can actually feel it, it's so nice. Next time you're outside and it's hot, just remember that this <laughs> scary thing is floating above you. Think of that next time you're getting your tan lines. In order to not go blind or, you know, light any fires in his home, Andrew required a special telescope with numerous filters. So if you're thinking of pointing your phone or telescope at the sun today, just, just don't do that. It's like the magnifying glass trick with the sun. Yeah, just fires one-on-one. -on -one. It's all bad, don't even try. And finally, number one, James Webb. Oh, our boy James Webb. What's he doing? What's he up to right now? Let's always check out on him. I told you I'd be back with more. While we patiently wait for James Webb to look deeper into our cosmos, I figured I'd leave you on a fun one. Also kind of scary though. Both the James Webb Space Telescope and the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft both orbit the Earth and the Sun's Lagrange Point 2. So they both drift in between the two space giants and on February 18th, a month ago, literally, like this was so recent, Gaia actually managed to get an image of James Webb. Just hanging out. Now look, I thought deep sea photos were hard to look at and like scary. This is another level, this is scary, check it out. Around 930,000 miles away, James Webb just sits there and floats. And he waits to take photos of life and just anything. He's just a little photographer, just floating out there. Very little reflected sunlight came Gaia's way and Webb therefore appears as a tiny faint speck of light in Gaia's two telescopes without any details visible. That's the official statement on finding James Webb. They're like, well, it was right there, we saw it, it was just little. This spacecraft also isn't meant to be a telescope, in case you're wondering. It has a sky mapper on board, but the Gaia is originally meant to track celestial objects' positions and distances, all that, you know, technical jargon. Imagine James Webb taking a photo back, it would be so HD. It's like, 
8K. He's like, turn around. What? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the after photo. Many of us have seen the portrait of Edwin Buzz Aldrin on the moon. It's an iconic image and has gone on to become one of the most inspiring images of all time, but what we don't see is the one that came immediately after. Maybe it's an arm, maybe it's a chest or a belly, either way it belongs to the taker of the photo, Neil Armstrong. Even the first people on the moon take accidental photos. I mean, it can't be easy in all of that gear. I can't even make a phone call with gloves on. I can't even imagine being in space trying to snap a selfie while making history. It's nice to see the clean, polished, inspiring part of history, but it's also nice to sometimes remind ourselves that we are all just humans, and humans are silly. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Crescent Earth. Less bizarre and more downright artistic and beautiful, truly the only thing that makes this photo bizarre is its lack of popularity, as well as the point of view and how opposite of our own it is. At a first glance, it looks like a photo of the night sky, as seen from a sort of piece of space technology, and it looks like the photo captures a sweet crescent moon. While this makes a lot of sense, what we're actually seeing is the Earth as it rises and looms over the Apollo 14 lander. That crescent is Earth! We look like that from the moon! It completely makes sense, it's just something I had failed to think about before. If you were to camp out on the far side of the moon, because the moon and Earth are tidally locked, you wouldn't be able to see Earth. But on the near side of the moon, you'd see the Earth all the time, and through the course of about a month, the Earth would also go through phases just like the moon does, but they'd be the direct opposite of the phases people on Earth would be witnessing the moon going through. If that made any sense at all. I can't believe I had never seen this photo before because it truly is stunning. In our number 8 spot today we have the moon. This image shows a series of three photographs that are just a few of the hundreds taken by the Apollo astronauts. While there are many interesting photos that were taken by those on the Apollo missions, the vast majority of them are just of the moon as seen from their window. Don't get me wrong, seeing photos of the moon up close and personal is magnificent. It's very cool and it's stunning to look at, but once you see it a few dozen times in photos, perhaps the novelty wears off a bit. Of course, the same can't be said for seeing it actually in real life out of the window next to you though. Until travel to the moon becomes a regular old everyday thing like it's a commute to work, that novelty won't ever wear off, as evidenced by the extremely extensive catalog of close up moon photos taken by the crew. It honestly is kind of nice to see though. To me, astronauts seem so cool and serious and intelligent. And while all of those things likely are very true, they're also giddy, excited humans who were clearly thrilled to be where they were. It's just humanizing, that's all I'm saying. In our number 7 spot today, we have the end of the roll. This is a photo that was taken on the Apollo 7 mission, and while it was likely meant to be just a stunning photo, thank goodness it wasn't meant to include or document anything exceptionally important because, uh, well, the photo is greatly obscured by the end of the roll tape. <laughs> this photo is hilarious. It appears to be of Earth, and it looks like the photo would show this beautiful white swirl spanning across the blue planet, a beautiful piece of photography, if it weren't for the rectangle, taking up a third of the image right smack dab in the middle. These people are astronauts, not photographers, and despite that, they managed to take some exceptional photos while on their missions, so I think it's fair to cut them some slack for this one. It's not like their thumb was in the way or something like that. In our number 6 spot today, we have the selfie. The word selfie hasn't been around for that long, but people have been taking them for years. With adjustable views and forward facing cameras, it's definitely gotten a lot easier, but that didn't stop Apollo 17's Ron Evans from having his hand at them, while of course, in space. This photo shows about half of Ron, although it's tough to tell with him decked out in his spacesuit. Apparently he snapped this photo while he was retrieving exposed film from outside of the spacecraft. I think that means he was in the midst of a spacewalk when he snapped this selfie. That is perhaps the most badass selfie of all time. On the way back to Earth near the end of the mission, Evans did a 1 hour and 6 minute long spacewalk, so it's entirely possible that this is exactly where this photo is from. I mean, that would explain the absolute nothingness that can be seen behind him. In our number 5 spot today, we have 
number two. When we hear about space missions, we often hear of the grueling work and preparations, or perhaps the science and mathematics that went into the planning, or maybe we're just there for the cool photos and interesting discoveries. But whatever it is, we normally don't hear about, either from reports or the astronaut themselves, is how on earth they managed to use the facilities while flying through space and living in zero gravity. Well, thanks to Apollo 17, some of the mysteries surrounding it were unveiled, although this photo didn't exactly go viral. The final, for now, mission to the moon had those on board snapping shots of the plastic bags that were filled with their space pee. Also, note the device used to help collect it that is located at the top of the bag. Yeah, that little thing was actually cited as the reason women couldn't serve in the Apollo space program. You're telling me that NASA could figure out how to send people to the moon, but it was too difficult at the time to figure out the female anatomy and how a woman could pee in space? Okay, it's a little suspicious at best. And in our number four spot today, we have the Mars eclipse. So this is more of a video rather than one single image. Well, actually it's a series of 89 different images that, when strung together, act like a video, but I digress. It was all captured by NASA's Curiosity rover as it showed us insights into what life is like on Mars. So on Earth, we have this weird coincidence that the distance ratio between the Earth and the Moon versus the Earth and the Sun is almost the same as the size ratio between the Moon and the Sun. This is why when the Moon passes in front of the Sun for a total eclipse, it covers it completely. On other planets, namely Mars, that's not what happens. When one of the moons of Mars passes in front of the Sun, it's much smaller and it appears like this. Curiosity was able to observe a ton of these instances, which are called trans it's from two moons, Phobos and Deimos. It's just really strange to see how things that the average person wouldn't have necessarily thought about are so completely different on other planets. Of course it makes sense and it's perfectly logical, it's just strange to see it right in front of your eyes and really take a second to think about it. In our number three spot today we have the series. This is a series of photographs that were taken on the Apollo 17 mission. The first in the series is another photo that has gone down in history as one of the most iconic. A photo of our beautiful planet as seen from space. I mean, come on, how stunning. We are so lucky to have this as our home. The next photo followed up the last iconic one, and while still interesting, it definitely leaves a little something to be desired. It's a simple photo of a floating engine stage. Still cool, just not as cool as the Earth one. The next photo, however, is when things go a little awry. It appears as though the next photo is someone's failed attempt at photographing the sun. It's so funny. It's just white. No one can see a thing. It's exactly what anyone would do and I love it. The final photo in the series has whoever took the photos returning back to snap some shots of Earth. I guess they likely didn't realize that the one they already had was better than anyone could have imagined. In our number two spot today, we have Mimis. This is a photo that my brain can't even begin to comprehend as real. It's a photo of one of Saturn's moons called Mimis. This moon just so happens to have a 130 kilometer wide crater on it that is called Herschel. This is cool and interesting and makes this moon look absolutely fascinating, but this photo caught by the Cassini spacecraft in 2005 really brings it to a whole new level. As the sun lit up the Herschel crater, the spacecraft caught this image where we can actually see the rings of Saturn in the background. Firstly, Saturn has at least 83 moons, so snapping such a gorgeous picture of one isolated one probably isn't the easiest thing in the world, especially for a spacecraft. Secondly, some of the moons are huge. Like the biggest of them all, Titan is bigger than the planet Mercury. It's less massive, and I know Mercury isn't a huge planet, but still, that's pretty huge for a moon, but I guess that isn't surprising considering the size of Saturn. The rings of Saturn are mostly comprised of ice particles with smaller amounts of rocky debris and dust, and it's exceptionally interesting to see how they look, even when you're up close. This photo probably isn't that bizarre, but it certainly is spectacular. And yes, you're not alone if you're sitting there thinking that this moon looks a heck of a lot like a Death Star. In our number one spot today, we have Alone. No, this isn't a photo from space thriller Gravity, which stars Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, but if you haven't seen it, it's a great movie and I would highly recommend it. 
Not necessarily the most scientifically accurate movie, but definitely anxiety inducing. Anyway, back to the photo. This is actually a photo of NASA astronaut Bruce McCandless in 1984. I have no idea how I hadn't seen this photo ever before as it clearly shows Bruce just roaming free from the space shuttle Challenger. No, obviously it wasn't the one that exploded. I had the same thought, they're different, I looked it up. He was able to do this thanks to a nitrogen powered jetpack which was called the manned maneuvering unit and it actually led to him being the first person to ever do a spacewalk untethered. Quite possibly the coolest and one of the most brave things ever. Like I'd want to do it so bad, but would I risk the possibility of endlessly floating till I met a horrific death once my supplies ran out? Probably not. Bruce had some interesting things to say about the experience, however, saying, quote, I was grossly overtrained. I was just anxious to get out there and fly. I felt very comfortable. It got so cold my teeth were chattering and I was shivering, but that was a very minor thing. I'd been told of the quiet vacuum you experience in space, but with three radio links saying, how's your oxygen holding out? Stay away from the engines and when's my turn? It wasn't that peaceful. It was a wonderful feeling, a mix of personal elation and professional pride. It had taken many years to get to that point. 